Okay, um, so we are going to get started at 1055 and I want to allow enough time for our two presenters to share their really exciting content. Um, this session is again on innovative forms of smoke and tobacco free policy work. I'm really excited to be joined by Richmond Tan, who is a graduate of UCLA, and he was also on our COF Student Leadership Board. And Richmond has done a lot of work with UCLA and some just really excited. I don't want to don't want to uncover too soon what Richmond worked on, but it's a really innovative um, strategy that is still being worked on and still um, trying to figure out how to utilize some, an awesome program that UCLA is leading on. And then also excited to introduce Dr. Kimberly Pulvers from CSU San Marcos. And Dr. Pulvers has been working on smoke and tobacco free efforts since helping advocate for the policy at CSU SM, and now is working on a tobacco related disease research program or TRDRP grant on um, some new technology to really help with policy compliance and also something I talked about earlier, which is data collection, which is very critical to smoke and tobacco free policy work. So um, we're gonna allow each speaker about 18 to 20 minutes to speak and then we will have a question and answer period. If you have questions throughout either of the presentations, please feel free to put them in the chat box and then we'll save all questions for the end of the session. So without further ado, I'll go ahead and introduce Richmond and Richmond, you can share your screen. Perfect, thanks so much for the introduction, Kim. And thanks for having me. Can you see my screen? Okay, great. Um, so my presentation today is on uh, innovative forms of smoke and tobacco-free policy compliance at UCLA. Uh, and I'm Richmond Tan. Um, so just a little bit about me. So I graduated UCLA in 2019 with a degree in microbiology, immunology, and molecular genetics. I'm very passionate about eliminating health disparities uh, through health equity. Uh, I'm hoping to pursue an MD degree. And uh, what, during my time at UCLA, I worked on a project with uh, Dr. Ong, uh, who is the uh, UCLA Breathe Well leader. Um, and we worked on a project to tackle compliance of smoke-free policy at UCLA. And so I continued these efforts um, as a 2019 to 2020 cough leader uh, with the California Youth Advocacy, Advocacy Network. And I'm currently working with Kim and Alex on a uh, web-based training. Um, so one of the first uh, questions uh, when I was at UCLA uh, walking around um, was that I noticed that it was a smoke-free campus, um, but I could still see a lot of tobacco and smoke use uh, throughout the campus. And so that was definitely um, an issue. Um, and then so something I thought about was, well, what, where is that coming from? And then so it really came down to compliance issues um, because although the policy was already uh, implemented at the time, uh, UCLA was did set the precedent for the UC um, campuses to be the first campus to become uh, smoke and tobacco free in 2013. Um, but the main issue was still compliance um, since there were a lot of people who were not complying with this policy. So um, I think uh, because of that issue, we kind of need to take a step back first and just look um, to see, well, what's wrong with um, enforcement of our smoke-free policy at that time? And, you know, what can we do to change that? Um, so in troubleshooting first, kind of what went wrong or what we can improve uh, with enforcement. First, um, it's just the fact that, you know, by finding violators is negative punishment. When you look at that from a psychology perspective, um, you know, you're, you're finding them, you're taking away their money. Um, and so that's punishing that behavior. Um, the second thing is that a lot of smoke-free advocates and our uh, UCPD uh, campus officers uh, feared confrontation with uh, the violators. And so we didn't wanna have that conflict between them. And so as a result, our current smoke-free policy had essentially no teeth. Um, and so because of this, it perpetuated this negative cycle because uh, we weren't really 
addressing the disease, the root problems of um, the disease, which is, you know, the addiction. And instead we were trying to address the symptoms. And um, so, you know, that gave us a lot of um, freedom to kind of just step back and kind of look to see, you know, well, what's, what can we do to change this? And um, during the 2019 um, uh, con college conference uh, with Cyan, um, I learned that this was not just an issue isolated to UCLA. It was an issue that was prevalent across other smoke-free campuses um, in California. Um, and so that really started me to think about, well, what are some ways that we can you know, improve uh, enforcement? Um, and so when innovating and in thinking about innovating our campus approach to enforcement and substance use, um, I think first we just need to take a step back and look through it with an equity lens. And then so thinking about, well, can we solve, you know, the larger upriver issue, um, you know, of addiction? And then so, again, it's kind of shifting um, that focus that Julie talked about in the um, opening presentation today um, from criminalization and punishment um, into something more positive. And so what is that? Um, so, you know, in thinking about these questions and when you're innovating, uh, sometimes it's helpful to look at other um, similar programs to see, um, you know, uh, if we can model um, these patterns. And so um, in doing our research, you know, to see, well, what is working? Um, there is this uh, Ruin Bike Smart program at UCLA, which is similar uh, to traffic school. So I don't know if... Uh, you guys are familiar with traffic school, but basically, in essence, um, it's basically having if uh, there's a violator um, of the policy, instead of finding them the complete citation, um, they have the opportunity instead to take an educational course. Um, and with that, they can um, uh, not, they don't have to pay the full citation, and um, there's just more equity in that. Um, method. So um, that kind of concept was brought to uh, the Bruin Bike Smart program at UCLA. So uh, we would have, there, there are violators of um, biking policies, such as over speeding or just um, running the stop signs. And so instead of giving these uh, biking violators um, a full citation, they can opt to take an educational course instead. So because many of them are perhaps are not aware of these policies, um, and so it gives them more opportunity um, instead of negatively uh, punishing them. Um, and so in a sense that solves the upriver issue and it just uh, promotes greater equity throughout. And then so that gave us, looking at that program um, and its successes, it gave us um, an opportunity to reimagine our response at UCLA um, to enforcement from one of criminal justice to one more centered on public health. And uh, it would allow us to put resources and funding into things that worked. Um, and based on what Julie talked about in the opening uh, presentation today um, about how CDC guidelines show that education has more of a positive impact on improving these public health outcomes. Um, that perhaps could have been, or maybe um, a better uh, and more innovative approach to enforcement. So it, again, it's taking the shift from criminalization and punishment and taking it to a more health-centered uh, educational approach. Uh, and then again, it's taking that concept of like traffic school and then changing it more into a concept of tobacco school, uh, a divergent program. And then so in creating this uh, tobacco school at UCLA, um, we had a couple goals in mind. Um, and so some of these goals include first fostering a higher level of wellness on our smoke-free campus. Um, the second thing is positive reinforcement. So again, taking it, uh, taking a step back and looking at it, at it from that psychology perspective of from negative punishment of criminalization um, to a more positive reinforcement strategy, which is to educate violators on the harmful effects of tobacco and substance use. 
Um, another goal that we had was to try and reduce the stigma surrounding tobacco and substance use treatment. Uh, and in a sense, that would be to really encourage violators to be more to be more open and proactive about seeking treatment. And ultimately, I think it really comes down back to our central theme today of today's um, uh, presentations, which is equity. And that is really to support um, these people and be in solidarity with their position as victims of addiction rather than trying to criminalize it. And if we can see it from that perspective, um, I think that will really help in terms of the equity standpoint. Um, and then so uh, in creating this program, uh, what we wanted to do was, again, take the Bruin Bike Smart program and adapt that approach um, to tobacco school. Um, so we studied the Bruin Bike Smart program. And so how it worked was um, uh, violators may utilize the course once every 12 months, and um, they use the learning management system through uh, the Max IT software to build the website. Um, and then so we could we would be able to import some of uh, these infrastructure from uh, Max IT and then import the web-based learning modules from Cyan, which we are currently working on. Um, and then after passing uh, the course, um, there would be a certificate of completion. And then so now just to kind of take a um, look at, well, what are some of the successes and challenges uh, with this tobacco school program? And what can we do to, um, what are our goals looking at um, what we've done so far? Um, so uh, first, in terms of, I would say the successes of the program, um, it's first of all, the partnerships with Cyan for the uh, web-based training module as well as um, adapting the course workflow from Bruin Bike Smart. And so having these uh, infrastructure already in place saved a lot of valuable time and resources on our end. Um, and so we're not, uh, and also finishing the website, but we're not done yet because uh, the program has not been fully implemented uh, as we are still waiting for some uh, finalizing um, aspects. And so that kind of leads me into the challenges of um, the UCLA Tobacco Free Campus Breathe Well Program. Um, so one of the challenges was that, um, you know, we assumed that a lot of the violators would have a UCLA um, login uh, and ID. However, um, we realized that a lot of violators actually may not be from UCLA, they may be visitors, um, and then so they would still need to create an ID. Um, and then so just being able to match um, their identification to um, the citation would definitely be more of a, um, an issue. Another challenge um, that we are still working on is just trying to figure out what um, the course fee would be. Um, at first, we were thinking about uh, charging a nominal fee um, just to pay for the infrastructure of the course, um, but uh, that is still in debate. Um, another thing is just um, the technical aspects of um, creating this program. So um, uh, when we we are still working on the um, uh, learning modules um, on Cyan, um, but uh, we in the beginning we did have some difficulty because uh, we needed the programs to be SCORM compliant, which is a technical standard for e-learning. Uh, so that is something that we are still um, working on. And then finally, I think this would this is the most challenging aspect of the program is just, and it may also be if you decide to implement this program into your campus, is just trying to convince um, the key stakeholders um, to approve this program for campus implementation. And so on our part, um, it's just still trying to convince the UCPD and key stakeholders like the LA City Attorney's Office um, before we can get this program uh, up and running. And then so um, what are our goals for the near future? Well, first it is really to finalize the web-based training program with uh, the California Youth Advocacy Network. Two is to fully implement the, pro the tobacco school program UCLA. And three is to uh, implement this course to campuses across the state and to your campus if you're watching. So um, thanks so much for uh, 
listening. Um, and this is my email. Uh, we'll take questions at the end. And um, feel free to contact me if you're interested in bringing this program to your campus. Thank you. Thank you so much, Richmond. Uh, I am now going to turn it over. And again, yes, I love to see the applause. That was awesome. Um, and I'm now going to turn it over to Dr. Kimberly Pulvers from CSU San Marcos to talk about the work she's doing. And go ahead if you have questions for Richmond. I have. There's. He shared a lot of really valuable information. Um, so go ahead and put those into the chat if you have them, so that we can save them, and then we will ask those questions at the very end. All right. <clears throat> Hi everybody. You seen uh, my screen about the tobacco tracker? Yes. All right. So um, as we know, um, smoke and tobacco free policies are a necessary first step. Uh, once we have our policies, we need to work on compliance. Um, and so uh, my collaborator, um, Eliza Tong at UC Davis and myself, um, were inspired um, to, to try something new, um, to try to create culture change at our campuses using crowdsourcing. And um, where we wanted to, to um, provide a way for the many people who um, like having a, a tobacco-free policy on their campuses, they support it, but yet they're not comfortable approaching violators or informing people about the policy. They still want to do something to be involved and to help. Um, and so surveillance is something that they can do. And we created a tool for them uh, to do that. Um, and so we created a, um, a web-based tool um, called the Tobacco Tracker. Uh, what you're seeing on your screen are um, the two um, versions um, adapted for each of our campuses respectively. Um, we didn't create this as an app um, because uh, this would create a barrier for people to access it. Um, but we, what we used was a very simple um, interface that most um, colleges have access to. Um, it's called ArcGIS. And so it's creating a survey um, in ArcGIS, which then operates like an app once um, somebody saves the website to their phone, or they could access it through a QR code or uh, directly um, on a website um, where it's hosted on the college campus or even through the campus app. Um, it can be embedded in that. Um, and, um, and essentially it provides a way for um, people on campus to tell us where they're smoking, vaping, or related litter. And from that, we can take actions um, to boost compliance. So I'm gonna share with you what the uh, kind of the components of the tool, some of the results um, from um, using this tracker for a year at UC Davis and Cal State San Marcos. And then I'll talk to you about some of the actions that we've taken with the, the intelligence that comes in uh, using the tracker. So the tracker set up for reports of smoking, vaping, or related litter. And um, we did frame this um, initiative from an environmental lens. Um, we did lots of focus groups and talking with stakeholders on our campuses and nobody wanted um, a narc or something where they were reporting on people, um, but they did want a way to um, sort of support the environment. And so we sort of, we led with litter from smoking or vaping as, as being kind of the first thing that we were asking them to look for. Um, but we know where there's litter from smoking or vaping. I mean, someone had been there smoking or vaping. And so of course we included a way for them to report that. We also wanted a way for them to report um, that things look good and that there weren't problems um, in the area. But if you have somebody that was reporting litter from smoking or vaping, then they could tell us what type of litter it was, either a cigarette butt, cigarette packaging, e-cigarette material, or marijuana packaging. And they can upload a photo. And, and then we would have a repository of evidence of exactly what litter and where it's located um, on our campus. And that location is what's um, tied to a GIS, which is a really um, helpful um, component of this tracker. Um, if they're telling us that they see smoking or vaping, um, the tracker asks what the smoke or vapor was from. Um, that could be a cigarette, e-cigarette or jewel, marijuana, um, or if they don't know what the smoke or vapor was, they can tell us that, or they could even write in that it was something else. Um, 
And now um, the, the final step would be for them to tell us where is it that the smoking, vaping, or related litter um, is. And so if they're on their mobile phone, they can use their location services and that automatically will pinpoint the location for us. From a computer, um, they can um, drag the map to get the uh, this little icon to line up to, to tell us this is where I am. Or um, we, we could, um, we included a, a drop down menu for people that don't like using maps or did have a barrier with their location services. They could use a drop down menu, um, which just has a list of all the different locations on campus in terms of buildings and parking lots. Um, and then we did want to know a little bit about who was using the tracker. And so we asked what their primary role on campus was. Um, we, the users of our tracker tended to be about half and half between students and staff. And, um, and then once they submit their report, they get a thank you screen that just verifies we got your data and we provided some reinforcing message that tells them, you know, the report makes a difference. Here's what we're gonna do with your report. So let me um, share with you sort of what kind of data you might expect to get uh, using a tracker and just how widely it might be utilized. And then I'll share with you what you can do with that data based on at least what we did at Cal State San Marcos and UC Davis. Um, so we had the tracker in use at two campuses, um, as I said, Davis and San Marcos for roughly a year. Um, and so we had almost all of a spring semester um, and then, you know, both campuses don't, ha don't have a lot of activity in the summer, but when we came back um, in the fall of 2019, we had a full semester there. Um, and then once we got back um, following winter breaks of spring semester of 2020, we had just a, a few weeks before we shut down um, due to COVID. So this is the time period that we're talking about, about two full academic semesters. In that time, we got um, about 1,300 um, reports, most of which were valid. Um, most people were providing you know, serious um, information, but we were able to screen out 52 um, what seemed like obvious bogus reports. And so the data that I'm gonna show you comes from um, 1,268 valid reports. Um, so the tracker was fairly well utilized um, in a short amount of time. Um, and what we got um, out of the reports were about half of them were reports of smoking or vaping. 29% um, were people telling us things look good, no smoking, vaping, or related litter. And about 19% of folks reported to us tobacco-related litter. Um, in terms of the smoking and vaping, um, about half of those reports were of smoking. 36% were vaping and 7% were of marijuana, suspected marijuana use. And in terms of the litter reports, 80%, um, a large majority were cigarette butt litter that was reported. 14% was um, cigarette packaging. 3% um, was um, e-cig or vaping related litter. And less than 1% was um, marijuana related packaging. Uh, we were surprised by this. Um, we did expect um, to get more reports of vaping related litter, given that vaping was so is you know was reported so much on our campuses. And so this is a finding that you know it really warrants for the research. Um, it could be that there's not as much vaping related litter. It could be that people don't recognize vaping related litter, um, or they're not as motivated to report it. Um, so that's something to point out is that this type of crowdsourcing based surveillance um, means that anyone on the campus, regardless of what level of training or observation they have, you know, they're reporting based on their own motivations. And so it's not, a, you know, it's not controlled data collection. Um, it's not necessarily um, meant to replace um, a scientific environmental scan. Um, but for many campuses that don't have the resources to do formal data collection, um, putting a tracker like this in the many hands of, of um, the campus community who want to be involved, want to help, they care about having a smoke-free policy, and they're willing to do a low-stakes activity like surveillance, 
it, it is informative, but, but like I said, the caveat is, um, you know, it could be that there is more vaping related litter than 3%, but this is what people told us they saw or what they were willing to report. Um, so here's a look at what happens with, with the GIS component of the tracker. Um, we get a dot map that tells us where on campus these reports are coming in from. Um, the red dots are for, for uh, smoke or vapor reports. The green are the areas of look skid reports and the black are the reports of litter from smoking or vaping. Um, and then um, we can sort of click any particular dot and get details on the report. So in this case, this was a smoke or vapor report in which cigarettes um, were reported and it's time stamped and tells us um, also a description of where exactly that location is. Um, here's an example of a, um, a litter report that came in with the black dot that tells us it was a cigarette butt, when and where it was. And um, in this case, there wasn't a photo uploaded um, with this report, but if there was, it would show. Um, and then from there, what we did to really translate into actions was we wanted to, to kind of put um, zones um, on top of, of our dot map um, and, and put together what's called a heat map where we could visually see where are the, the regions or the areas on campus that need attention. And the darker colors reflect higher density of smoking, vaping, or related litter. And we were able to screen out the looks good reports from this. So, so it's really kind of a map that tells us where attention and intervention is needed. Um, and so what we did um, with this um, was different according to the infrastructure of our two campus programs. So at Cal State San Marcos, um, we had an ambassador program in place. And so what we did on a weekly basis was we would look at our density map and to see where are the, where are the reports coming in from? Where are the hotspots? This is where we're gonna send our ambassadors in the upcoming week to do their rounds and they will um, approach violators um, if they see them <laughs> and they will clean up any litter, um, tobacco related litter that's in those places. So that's what we did um, with the, the, uh, the tr tracker data at Cal State San Marcos. At Davis, um, they, they don't have an ambassador program. And so what they did was they used the map to determine where to install new signage. Um, and so um, they ended up installing 17 new permanent signs and hotspots identified by the tracker, um, such as their um, arboretum. And the signage that they put in um, promoted the tracker. Um, and so the signage says report smoke and litter for a cleaner campus. And they provided the URL um, where people can access the tracker. And so this is this tracker has become embedded as an important part of our uh, the tobacco control programming at both campuses, because we want to keep this data coming in and create this continual uh, loop. Um, where the, the campus community can engage with the policy, give us surveillance information, and then we can go and provide education and intervention in the areas that most need it. Um, so the, the other thing um, that was interesting is just having a tobacco tracker and promoting it has led to more engagement with reporting. Um, so what I'm showing you here is um, data from Cal State San Marcos um, in the blue, was um, before we had a tobacco tracker. And in the green is showing you how many reports of um, smoking, vaping, or related litter that came in once we had the tracker. And so pre-tracker in blue, we just had like a form on our smoke and tobacco free website. So there was a way for people to report, um, but it wasn't um, something easy to access um, like the, the tracker is. And so comparing, let's say, fall 2017, fall 2018, we had about 40 reports or complaints that came in. Um, whereas once we had the tracker in fall 2019, we have around 120 reports. So we just have a lot more intel coming in. And once these reports are here, there has to be some accountability back to our campus. And so this is data that we could take to our administration to say, you know, we have a problem here. 
um, what we did at Cal State San Marcos was we ended up, um, although we didn't um, design the tracker to be something where people could report um, on individuals, we did have individuals named. Um, sometimes in, in the reports, people would write in in the comment section and we identified that there were certain staff members whose names kept coming up over and over again. And so um, we had to do something with that information. And so we created a formal administrative letter process for complaints of employees. Um, it would be really nice to be able to take it a step further and have something like tobacco school, um, you know, to do in terms of education and programming for violators um, who we identify through the tracker. So we see the tracker being able to work hand in hand as a complementary method um, for any types of consequences that, um, that a campus decides to use. Um, at UC Davis, what they ended up doing with um, these reports in terms of actions, in addition to creating signage, was that they would communicate directly with whoever was sort of in charge, um, like for example, at housing. So if there was a report that came in about a certain dorm, um, they would reach out to the housing director and, um, and talk about the violation that was reported through the tracker. Um, now you might be thinking like, with all of the, you know, with these um, greater numbers of reports that came in with the tracker, does that just mean that there's more problems at, on your campus? Does that mean that there's actually more smoking, vaping, or litter? Or is it just that people are, you know, involved in surveillance? Um, we have data from Cal State San Marcos that it's, it's, it's the latter. Um, we have more people involved in surveillance, but the, the, the sort of the problematic um, tobacco use and vaping has actually decreased um, since we had the tracker. Um, so what you're seeing here is um, some data from um, before we had a 100% smoke and tobacco-free campus back in 2016, people 72% of our campus um, community said that they saw someone using tobacco use on our campus in the past 30 days. Once we became 100% smoke and tobacco free and we installed signage everywhere, that number dropped to 52%. But then the following year, things sort of plateaued. We weren't making any more progress until we did start um, implementing the tracker at this point from 2018 to 2019, we then saw a further decrease in um, witnessing tobacco use on our campus. And so, you know, having the tracker, you know, it's not a compliance intervention in itself. That alone doesn't, you know, solely drive compliance, but it is, as I said, it's a tool to, to work alongside other interventions. Um, and it, but it did give us a little bit of, of a boost in terms of um, having, um, witnessing tobacco on campus uh, further reduce. And the same with um, exposure to secondhand smoke or vapor on campus. Um, that's something that we've been seeing decline since we've had a 100% smoke and tobacco free policy. And then we saw a further decline um, in this time between 2018 and 2019 when we got uh, the tracker on our campus at Cal State San Marcos. So, um, you know, what I've shown here, these last uh, bits of data from Cal State San Marcos. These results are not causal or definitive. Um, we definitely need controlled studies to understand precisely how the tracker um, influences markers of compliance. Um, and I ha have to say that, that we didn't see the same trends at, at Davis that we did at Cal State San Marcos. So at San Marcos, we saw you know, the impact um, of the tracker working potentially with our ambassador program in a way that, that led to improvements in um, compliance. And we didn't see that at Davis and we, we don't know why. It could be due to a lot of different things. Maybe it had to do with the fact that the ambassador program you know, was a more active program. Um, Davis also had a vaping awareness campaign going on at the same time. So it could be that folks at their campus were more likely to report problems on the tracker just because they had become more educated about vaping. 
Um, it could also be differences in our campus sizes or even the fact that um, we adopted our policies at different points in time. So we definitely need further research to understand how to use the tracker and, and what kind of um, impact it makes on compliance. Um, but what we do know is that the, the tracker brings us information that we can then incorporate into our education and our um, compliance interventions. Um, and what we also hope is that we're gonna see social norm change on our campuses. The more people that become aware of the policy and engaged with it, and taking an action like using the tracker gets people invested. And that's what we hope to be able to, to just see broader engagement um, and let that um, be something that um, you know, helps spread awareness and willingness um, to be involved at various levels um, with supporting the smoking tobacco free campuses. And, um, and I'll stop there um, so that we have uh, plenty of time for questions. Um, I'm grateful to um, TRDRP for funding our work and, and the many people that were involved um, in our study um, and, not, and what I presented to you today. Wonderful. Thanks so much, Kim. And I think just a couple tidbits that I want to really reiterate. And I, I said this at the beginning of the day, and I think it's really critical to reemphasize is the value of data collection and these policies to be able to measure change and impact and be able to have those conversations about how effective is compliance? Do we need to change what we're doing? And so that's what's so exciting about the work that um, Kim and Eliza are doing with this tracker is it gives a really simple tool for people to be able to utilize, to be able to get that data and, and if you are, work with a college that has yet to go, smoking tobacco free now is the best time to collect that data to really show the impact of the policy after implementation and compliance strategies happen. Um, another thing that was really, really apparent to me through both of the presentations is that combined approaches are oftentimes the most effective approaches. So. Uh, Kim, you alluded to this, or you actually said it in your presentation, that it's collecting that data um, using, using the tractor, pair, pairing it with an ambassador program or unique effective signage, and then having that next thing, which is what Richmond had talked about. And so if, if there is a way of having somebody refer an individual to a course that does education, not only on the policy, but on um, just motivating for quitting, just here are resources, this is the benefit of quitting, and really pairing all of those things together, the more effective we can be in reaching compliance and reaching our goal, which is, again, to prevent initiation and really to support people in living a tobacco-free life. So um, I love the combination of of these two presentations and to really show the impact of some of these new and innovative ways of trying to achieve compliance. So I do wanna open it up for questions. We have about seven minutes. So if anybody has a question, please go ahead and put it in the chat box or feel free to unmute yourself and you can ask the question directly to either Richmond or to Kim. I have a question for Kim. Hi, Kim, it's Julie Chopdi. Hi, Julie. Um, who developed this app? Right. Cool. Yeah, so we, at our campus, we have an ArcGIS specialist and um, it's a, you know, it's a staff member in IITS. And, um, you know, most universities have um, like courses in geography or um, GIS. And, and, and so that it's, it's about collaborations either like with whoever that department is on campus. Um, and it's something I've been told that um, like once students take a basic GIS class, they have the skills to be able to develop this because it's, it's, um, it's, a, it's a platform called Survey123. And um, you know, the, our, the programmer at our campus 
is someone that has a lot of expertise. And, and so he was able to do, you know, some, some sort of advanced things, um, but it doesn't necessarily need to be that advanced. Um, and so I would say, um, you know, just looking up um, on your campus, um, I would start with the geography department um, because that's where ArcGIS is taught. And most campuses, um, you know, because of they, this is embedded in their instruction, they, they will have a subscription um, to it. And like, I know that our local um, community colleges here in San Diego offer an, um, an, a GIS certificate program. So it's something that's part of the, it's a very common part of the curriculum. It's a growing um, job sector. And if you look at all the COVID um, tracking and dashboards, they're all run by ArcGIS. Um, and so it's a really um, emerging area. And, and so um, with instruction and curriculum comes uh, the resources and the access to the software. Great. And so it, once it's developed <clears throat> to maintain it, mm -hmm. is it pretty like just self-maintained or do you need students yeah. to maintain it and upkeep it? So it, it, it runs itself in terms of data that comes in, um, but um, it does requ require cleaning um, to be able to have really precise information. Like for example, the bogus reports that we found and we wanted to remove that out of the database that takes somebody to go to look at it every week. Um, and um, it can be a student, um, but it is something that requires maintenance in terms of, of the usability of the data being like good valid data. Um, but if you didn't have that type of, you know, resource, you know, the map just continually continues to generate itself. But if you want to make sure all every dot is a valid dot, you do have to have someone going in to look at each report and decide is this bogus? If so, I'm going to delete it. Um, things like that have to happen to have accurate data. But I know that, um, you know, we did that because this was for research. But if we were doing this just sort of for field work, we might just live with that noise and just say, well, this isn't 100% accurate, but you know, it's giving us information that, that we're gonna go with and, and know that there is some error here, um, but we're gonna you know, utilize it anyway. Um, we are working on um, like a dashboard um, to be able to, to have um, another way to visualize the data. And once we have all of that together, we're going to provide it to, to CYAN so that they can create, a, I think, a toolbox so that campuses can see exactly um, what we did and what the data cleaning looks like should they want to go into the depth of um, the depth that we did. Um, but it's not necessarily required. Thank you. Great job. Nice to see the tool. I've heard about it for years. <laughs> I actually had a question um, for Richmond. I don't know if there's other um, okay. questions, but um, I was curious how, um, like what's your infrastructure at UCLA for um, like mandating that someone would go to tobacco school, for example. So is there someone on campus that would go up to someone that's smoking or vaping and say, I need to see your ID and I'm giving you a, a citation that you have to go to traffic school. I was wondering what the authority is. Right, yeah, that's why we had discussions with uh, UCPD was because that would kind of be on their part to really enforce the citations. And then from there, they, um, you know, they would link it to the UCLA ID and then they could, um, you know, then take the uh, tobacco school. Um, but yeah, that's why we needed their, they were one of the key stakeholders because they would be the primary enforcement uh, agency. Okay. That's one of the barriers we've had at our campus is that our, our police um, don't wanna be involved. <laughs> and yeah. so that, um, I don't, and then we're like, would we be able to have our ambassadors be able to have the authority to, to then give someone um, you know, a, a, a citation, I, I, that's that's something that, that's, I guess, a challenge. And so I was curious how y'all did that. Right, yeah. And that's why, like, we are still debating in terms of, like, the course fee, whether we want to do, like, a nominal fee or just have it be an open access platform just so that, you know, it doesn't feel like, you know, they 
stuff violators have to like pay it, you know, anything. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, we are just about at time. So I, I appreciate again, Richmond, thank you so much for being here today and for that awesome presentation. And Kim also to you, thank you for sharing this information. Um, Dr. Pulvers and Dr. Tong did a presentation, a much longer webinar on this instrument for us back in May. So if you're interested in seeing the whole thing on promotion, finding um, more of the technical pieces on the instrument that they've created that can be found on our website on cyanonline.org. And it's just on our training and events page under the archived webinars on college. So thank you again to you both for being here. Thank you to everybody for participating in this session. And we are now going to be heading in back to our general session for closing and evaluation, which we would very much appreciate your feedback on, um, on this whole workshop series. And then we will be ending the day at 12 o'clock today. Thank you so much.